This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for June 19th through the 25th. On this week's show, we discuss a report that decimated the entertainment industry, a classic song that started an icon's career, a couple sad endings to amazing careers, and we say happy birthday to a few people, one of whom is a member of Duran Duran. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. Let's start with a scary time in American history. It is said that America is more divided today than it's ever been. The more you study history, though, the more you realize that that statement is a complete and utter lie. These days, social media and the media in general, with its clickbait style of quote-unquote journalism, make you definitely feel like we're more divided because division makes them money and gives them fame and publicity. In reality, though, we are no more divided than the 1960s when you had the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, the Counterculture Movement, and the Feminist Movement as the fights of that era. There was also, of course, the Slavery Era and the Civil War, and there was this next chapter in American history that we're going to talk about. First, a little backstory. In the late 1940s, after World War II, Communism became the biggest thing threatening America and Western values. The Cold War began to take shape and the battle lines were drawn. To that end, an American textile importer by the name of Alfred Kohlberg saw an opportunity and began to make a name for himself. He was a member of the China Lobby and the John Birch Society, both groups whose members saw communists around every corner and in every crevice of society especially in the entertainment industry. Kohlberg helped to fund an organization called American Business Consultants Incorporated, which was also led by three former FBI agents. This group released a newsletter called Counterattack. The groups worked closely with infamous United States Senator Joseph McCarthy, who by then had made it his mission to root out communism and homosexuals in the United States government. The group also worked with members of the United States House Un-American Activities Committee. That committee had already been using its powers in the late 1940s against the Hollywood Creative Committees after Hollywood reporter, founder, and publisher William R. Wilkerson published an anti-communist propaganda column called A Vote for Joe Stalin, a.k.a. Soviet Union dictator Joseph Stalin. In the article and in his following articles, Wilkerson named Hollywood creatives as being sympathetic to the Soviet Union. Some decades later, Wilkerson's son apologized for what his father had done, saying that his father had used his power against the Hollywood community as revenge for not being able to buy a movie studio for himself at the time. I guess if you can't build it, then burn it down any way possible, even when it's full of lies, I guess. In any event, On June 22, 1950, the American Business Consultants Incorporated Group, through Counterattack, published a newsletter called Red Channels, The Report of Communist Influence in Radio and Television. This report named at the time 151 entertainment industry people who they said were either communists or communist sympathizers. Among this list were some pretty famous names. People on the movie end, such as Edward G. Robinson and Orson Welles, made the list. People on the music end who made the list were entertainer Burl Ives, composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein, jazz pianist and singer Hazel Scott, composer Aaron Copeland, entertainer Lena Horne, folk singer Pete Seeger, folk singer Oscar Brand, entertainer Larry Adler, conductor Dean Dixon, entertainer Alfred Drake, folk singer Richard Dyer Bennett, radio personality Arthur Gaith, 
folk singer Tom Glazer, blues guitarist Josh White, entertainer Irene Wicker, pianist and composer Morton Gould, conductor and producer Horace Grenell, lyricist Yip Harburg, entertainer Felix Knight, lyricist John Latouche, pianist Ray Lev, composer Lynn Murray, composer Harold Rome, composer Earl Robinson, and jazz clarinetist and band leader extraordinaire Mr. Artie Shaw. Radio show host John Henry Falk, who worked for CBS Radio, along with entertainer Harry Belafonte, songwriter Alan Boritz, and record producer Lester Koenig were named in following Red Channel's lists that were put out pretty much within a month or two after the original one. But those following lists stuck primarily with Hollywood actors and screenwriters. In total, between all the lists, over 350 Hollywood creatives were named as being communists or communist sympathizers. There had been some pushback in the late 1940s by Hollywood to what had been deemed the Red Scare. In 1947, there was a group called the Committee for the First Amendment, which had some heavy hitters from the entertainment industry like Judy Garland, Lena Horne, Dorothy Dandridge, and Gene Kelly. Unfortunately, their efforts were to no avail once the list came out and the Hollywood studio head started telling their more famous workers like actor Humphrey Bogart to either get in line or risk losing their careers as well. Bogart actually had to put out a press release stating that he had been, quote, naive and foolish, end quote, for being a part of the group. He never did condemn the actual group, as that was part of the compromise that he had worked out with the studio heads. The result of being on the Red Channel's list was that the artists who were named on the newsletter were blacklisted. People lost their livelihoods and their lives were completely shattered with no money coming in, divorces, child custodies, etc., etc. The only way to get off the list and be in the good graces of the American government again was to provide testimony, and more importantly, names of other so-called communist sympathizers, to the House Un-American Activities Committee. Some artists, like Burl Ives, went before the committee and gave names. Most did not, and those paid a heavy price with their careers and ultimately their lives on occasions. By the late 1950s, the House Committee's influence had quieted down, thanks in large part to the backlash to Joseph McCarthy's tactics in the United States Senate, and also by a reporter who was pretty powerful at the time named Edward R. Murrow. The aforementioned John Henry Falk sued the owners of the Red Channel's newsletter for falsely claiming that he attended and organized communist events. CBS then fired Falk a year after Falk had filed the lawsuit. Falk originally won $3.5 million in 1962, but the amount was reduced on appeal. By then, though, the damage had been done to the lives of all the artists who had been named in the Red Channel's newsletter, which was published originally on June 22, 1950. Next, let's talk about Mr. Jones and a famous major. In June of 1969, Mr. Jones was on the outs with his record label. His first album was a complete flop, and he was looking for a new label. His manager negotiated a one-record deal with another label, so back into the studio he went. And on June 22, 1969... He recorded a reworked version of a song he recorded earlier that year for a promotional film. The song was inspired by another film, 2001 A Space Odyssey. The song was released on July 11, 1969. The song's timing was intentional. At that time, the Apollo space missions were huge news. Apollo 11 had taken off on its history-making voyage to the moon. The song wasn't released until after the mission, though, since it told the story of an astronaut who was lost during a space mission. Would have looked kind of bad. 
Once the song was released, it became a huge hit in England, and Mr. Jones, who by then had changed his last name to Bowie, had finally found his foot in the door in the music industry. The rest, as they say, is history. David Bowie became one of the most influential artists of all time. The astronaut who was lost on the song's mission, Major Tom, was found in the 1980s in a sequel of sorts to the song, Major Tom Coming Home by Peter Schilling. Bowie's song, Space Oddity, is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as being one of the 500 songs at the time that helped to shape rock and roll. And the famous studio version of Space Oddity was recorded by David Bowie on June 22, 1969. Next, let's talk about an icon and an iconic album. Prince Rogers Nelson was born on June 7, 1958, and was the product of musical parents. Prince's nickname was Skipper throughout childhood because he hated the name Prince. Prince also suffered from epilepsy when he was younger and often had seizures. The disease, though, did not stop Prince from being involved in sports, including playing basketball. He also studied ballet, which definitely helped with his dancing skills in his music videos and on stage. Prince's parents divorced when he was 10 years old, and the rest of his childhood was spent bouncing around back and forth between parents and his new step-parents, much like children of divorce do. Prince also found himself gravitating towards music, having written his first song when he was 7 years old. He was rumored to have learned to have played at least 10 instruments pretty well by the time he had hit his 20s. By the time he was 19, Prince was signed to a managerial contract, and based on the strength of his demo tape, Prince signed with Warner Brothers Records and released his first album, For You, on April 7, 1978, just two months shy of his 20th birthday. A little over a year later, Prince released his self-titled second album, which had the hit I Want to Be Your Lover. It also had a minor hit called Why You Want to Treat Me So Bad. In 1980, he released the album Dirty Mind, which got him into a little bit of trouble with songs like the name Head. Don't know why that would have gotten him in trouble. Anyway, it also got him an opening act spot on Rick James's tour. 1981's album Controversy spawned the hit of the same name, and around that time, Prince started forming side projects like the group The Time. Prince's double album, 1999, was released in 1982 and had the top 10 hits 1999, Little Red Corvette, and Delirious. Little Red Corvette was helped from being one of only two songs from black artists that MTV was playing in heavy rotation when the music video came out, the other video being Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. Still, five albums in five years was only the beginning, and Prince was about to become a superstar only two years later. During his 1999 album, Prince decided that he wanted to make a movie that was very loosely based on his life. He called the movie Purple Rain. This album was the second album to also credit his band, The Revolution, as they did help to write some of the songs on this one. Certain songs have a bit of a history. Let's Go Crazy is probably the best crafted song about moral ethics ever to be made. The line towards the end about how pills, thrills, and daffodils will kill is now pretty ironic considering how Prince passed away from an opioid overdose in 2016. The famous drum machine intro after the organs in the beginning of the song is Prince's go-to drum machine, the Lin LM-1. Take Me With You was supposed to be for his side project, Apollonia 6, but instead found its way onto the soundtrack. Contrary to popular belief, the female voice on the song is not Apollonia, it is not Lisa and Wendy from the band, it's singer Jill Jones. Computer Blue was originally a 14-minute song, but got cut back. I'm pretty sure that the original version has shown up on one of those special edition versions of the album by now. 
Prince played all of the instruments on The Beautiful Ones and Darling Nikki, along with When Doves Cry. For Doves, he was trying to go with a different sound, so he pulled the bass line out of the song. The movie's director told Prince that he needed a song for a montage scene in the movie, so Prince went home that night and wrote and produced When Doves Cry during that night. I Would Die For You, Baby I'm a Star, and Purple Rain were all actually recorded a year before. At a benefit concert for the Minnesota Dance Theater on August 3, 1983, at the now-famous First Avenue Club that was in the movie, Prince debuted those three songs, as well as his new guitarist for The Revolution, Wendy Melvoin. The title track of the album has its own history. According to The Revolution's keyboardist, Dr. Fink, Prince wanted to write a song that sounded almost like it could have come from Bob Seger. The band Journey, though, tells a different story. According to them, Prince called them up one day and mentioned that he had written a song that sounded an awful lot like their hit song, Faithfully. He wanted the group's blessing so they wouldn't go and sue him afterwards. Not only did they give him their blessing once they heard the song, but they actually thanked him for asking, since a lot of bands just basically ripped off Journey's sound without even asking them first. If you actually listen to Purple Rain and Faithfully back-to-back, you can definitely tell the similarities between the two songs. Purple Rain, the album, came out on June 25, 1984, and spent 32 weeks on the Billboard Albums Chart's Top 10, taking the number one spot for 24 straight weeks. Purple Rain made rumpled pirate shirts a fashion trend at the time, along with being the basis for a famous Seinfeld episode. It also gave Prince an awful lot of awards, including Grammy Awards, a Golden Globe, and an Academy Award for Best Music Score. It is also considered a classic album and one of the greatest albums ever made. Prince's iconic soundtrack to the movie Purple Rain Released on June 25th, 1984. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Next, let's talk about two major passings during this week in music history. Francis Ethel Gum was born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, not Grand Rapids, Michigan, to parents who were vaudeville performers. Frances became part of her parents' act at the age of two when both her and her sister sang as the Gum Sisters. The family moved to California when Frances was four years old, and it was there, while performing at the age of 13, that she was discovered by a big movie studio. She was put in an awful lot of films, most of them musicals. Then, after some trouble, she was let out of her contract with the movie studio. Her famous Hollywood friend, Bing Crosby, gave her a guest spot on his radio show, which opened up another avenue to her career, getting back on stage in front of a live audience, like her childhood, with her sisters. She started doing concert tours and nightclub acts. One of those shows went on to become an album, which is the first album by a female performer to ever win a Grammy Award. Frances is considered a true Hollywood icon, but unfortunately, she also had a stereotypical Hollywood story. Having fame never, ever helped with her low self-esteem. 
She abused drugs and alcohol periodically throughout her life. Plus, she had suicide attempts, spent time in a sanitarium, and also a psychiatric hospital. She also had a bunch of financial issues and multiple marriages. Unfortunately, Frances passed away from an accidental barbiturate overdose while renting a house in London, England. Frances Scum was 47 years old at the time. Back to her career for a minute. While her concerts and recording career gave her new life, it was singing in the movies that actually gave her the most fame. The movies that she sang in are considered classics. The Wizard of Oz, Meet Me in St. Louis, Strike Up the Band, and her movies with Mickey Rooney. And by now, you know that I'm talking about the woman who was born on June 10th, 1922, Frances Ethel Gum, better known by her stage name, Judy Garland, who passed away from an accidental barbiturate overdose on June 22nd, 1969. Next, a very sad ending to a legendary career. As 2009 started, Michael Jackson found his career in freefall. By that time, he was rumored to be heavily in debt. His public image had taken a beating thanks to two criminal trials over the decades for child molestation and public behavior that created fodder for the tabloids. Michael had gone from being the king of pop to being wacko jacko, at least in the eyes of the media, especially the New York Post, who took a very strong liking to disliking everything that the guy stood for and was. Even when he held a protest against record labels for ripping off recording artists, the media still portrayed it as a publicity stunt when he was years ahead of his time in talking openly about the ills of the recording industry. Michael aimed to get back on top, if only for a little while. In March of 2009, he announced a set of concerts called the This Is It Tour. It was supposed to start in London, England, then go to Paris, France, perform also in New York City, and also in Mumbai, India. The choreography was being done by Kenny Ortega, the IT choreographer at that time, after working on the hugely popular high school musical TV movie. The concert dates were set, they also sold out pretty much immediately, and rehearsals began for the concert tour. Along with a career in decline and rumored heavy debt, Michael was also having health issues. He was especially having some very serious problems with his sleeping. He enlisted the help of Dr. Conrad Murray to help him with the sleeping problems. Dr. Murray was giving him a combination of propofol and two anti-anxiety drugs and was supposed to be constantly supervising Michael's sleep while these drugs were being administered. On the evening of June 24, 2009, Michael went to rehearsals for the tour. He ended rehearsals after midnight, and then he went home. During the morning of June 25th, Michael went to sleep. He did not wake up. The coroner labeled his death a homicide. Dr. Murray was brought up and convicted on involuntary manslaughter charges for leaving the room to take a phone call and for not monitoring Michael while the opioid drug cocktail was being administered. Dr. Murray ended up serving a two-year prison sentence. Michael's death overshadowed the death actually earlier that very day of another Hollywood legend, actress Farrah Fawcett, who passed away from cancer. As for the concert tour, well, thankfully the final rehearsal was a dress rehearsal and it was being recorded. The footage from that final rehearsal was used in the concert film Michael Jackson, This Is It, which became the biggest money-making documentary of all time up to that point, despite only being in theaters for a few weeks. The King of Pop, Michael Jackson, passed away 
at the age of 50 years old on June 25th, 2009. All right, it is time to do some birthdays now. First, let's say happy birthday to Nigel. Nigel is a bass player who plays in a new wave band that made it big in the early 80s and is still going strong to this very day, selling out stadiums worldwide. During some downtime with the band, Nigel had a few companies that he had started, along with doing a few solo albums. He also was a member of two different supergroups, Neurotic Insiders with Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols along with Matt Sorum and Duff McKagan of Guns N' Roses, as well as the band Power Station with his bandmate Andy Taylor from his original gig, the legendary Mr. Robert Palmer, and drummer Tony Thompson of the group Chic. They had the hits, Some Like It Hot, and their version of the T-Rex hit, Bang a Gong, Get It On, which was actually originally the other way around. Nigel, however, will forever be famous for being the bass player of his main band, Duran Duran, who have the hits, Notorious, Come Undone, Save a Prayer, Hungry Like the Wolf, Wild Boys, etc., 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 So, happy birthday to Nigel, who goes by his middle name, John. John Taylor, born on June 20th, 1960. Next up, this lady was born on June 25th, 1945. She was in a group with her sister Lucy, but found her biggest success as a solo artist. Her career has spread almost 50 years now. Along the way, she's had numerous top 10 smash hits, including one with her then-husband, along with one song where the subject of the song was sworn to secrecy for decades before she finally revealed it to be about three different men, only one of whom she has actually said publicly. That would be Warren Beatty. The singer-songwriter of that particular song, You're So Vain, along with the song Anticipation, etc., etc., and the ex-wife of James Taylor, who both sang the top ten song Mockingbird, Miss Carly Simon, born June 25th, 1945. Next, we lost this man late in 2016, Christmas Day to be precise, But during his time in the spotlight, he gave us songs both as a solo artist and as a member of one of the biggest selling duos in rock music history. As a member of that duo, they would be the first Western artist to perform in China. His debut solo album sold over 20 million copies worldwide. Then he faded from the spotlight for a while after numerous battles with his record company, and the path his career had gone on. Still, people remember him fondly, and his songs are still played everywhere and are considered classics. Whether it was Careless Whisper, Last Christmas, or Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go with the group Wham!, or with Faith, I Want Your Sex, or Freedom as a solo artist, his untimely passing at the age of 53 from a fatty liver left a mark on all of the Gen X generation. He was also inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame recently. Happy birthday, or as they say, happy heavenly birthday, to Mr. George Michael, born June 25th, 1963, under a Greek name that's way too long for me to try to even pronounce here, trust me. Jeffrey Arnold Beck was born on June 24th, 1944 in Surrey, England. Beck's fascination with the electric guitar started early in his life, although his mom wanted him to pursue piano. It was his determination and fascination with the guitar that would propel him to become one of the most influential and respected guitarists of all time. Beck's early years were steeped in music. Inspired by the likes of Les Paul, he honed his skills, eventually joining his first band, The Bandits, at the age of 16. 
a series of local bands followed, including the Deltones and the Tridents, where Beck began experimenting with effects pedals and crafting his signature sound. A crucial turning point came in 1963 when Ian Stewart, the pianist for the Rolling Stones at the time, introduced Jeff to the blues. This exposure, particularly to the works of Mr. Buddy Guy, profoundly influenced Beck's playing, adding raw emotion and expressive power to his playing style. In 1965, Beck's career took off when he was chosen to replace Eric Clapton as lead guitarist in the group The Yardbirds. This legendary band, known for their blues rock sound, was already pushing boundaries. Beck's arrival further ignited their creative fire, with songs like Shapes of Things and Over Under Sideways Down, they showcased his technical prowess and his love of feedback and distortion, two elements that would soon become trademarks to his style. Despite the band's commercial success and critical acclaim, Beck's needs for artistic exploration led him to leave the Yardbirds in 1966. This period also saw Beck's first solo foray with the single Hi-Ho Silver Lining, a pop experiment that foreshadowed his future genre-bending tendencies. Following his departure from the Yardbirds, Beck formed the Jeff Beck Group, a band that became a launchpad for some of rock's most iconic figures. With vocalist Rod Stewart, bassist Ron Wood, later of the Rolling Stones, as a guitarist no less, and drummer Mickey Waller, the group created a sound that fused blues rock with heavy metal and psychedelic music. Albums like Truth and Beckola showcase their raw energy and Beck's virtuosity with tracks like Beck's Bolero and Shape of Things becoming staples of classic rock radio. The group also witnessed the arrival of another future legend, vocalist Ronnie Montrose, who later formed his group Montrose. However, Internal tensions and a near-fatal car accident involving Beck led to the group breaking up in 1972. Undeterred, Jeff formed another power trio with bassist Tim Bogert and drummer Carmine Apice, formerly of the group Vanilla Fudge. Beck, Bogert, and Apice delivered a heavier, more hard rock sound on albums like Beck, Bogert, and Apice and Live in Japan. Their music explored complex time signatures and showcased Beck's ability to blend blues-inspired licks with blazing technical passages. And despite the critical acclaim, the band faced commercial challenges and broke up in 1974. Following the breakup of Beck, Bogart, and the Peace, Jeff Beck embarked on his own solo career that defied categorization. He, for instance, embraced a more instrumental approach this time around, showcasing his virtuosity across various genres. Albums like Blow by Blow and Wired incorporated elements of jazz fusion, funk, and world music, featuring collaborations with keyboardists such as Jan Hammer and Tony Hymas. Songs like Cause We Ended as Lovers and Escape became classic radio anthems, demonstrating Beck's ability to blend technical mastery with melodic beauty. The 1980s saw a shift in Beck's career, with him continuing to explore diverse musical styles. Beck embraced the rise of synthesizers and electronic music which is evident in his albums like There and Back in 1980 and Flash in 1985, which also happens to be my favorite Jeff Beck album. He also experimented with a finger-picking technique, abandoning the guitar pick altogether. This new approach yielded a more nuanced and expressive sound on albums like Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop, which he put out in 1989. Never one to shy away from collaboration, Beck lent his talents to a diverse group of musicians, which was something that he had actually done since the 1970s when he played on Stevie Wonder's Talking Book album, including an uncredited guitar part on the song Superstition. 
He also continued working with Rod Stewart, showing up on Rod's song Infactuation for Rod's 1984 album Camouflage and a cover version of the Curtis Mayfield penned Persuasion's recorded song People Get Ready for Jeff's 1985 album Flash, which again is my favorite Jeff Beck album. In the 1990s, Jeff continued to defy categorization, incorporating elements of world music, particularly Indian influences, into his works. Albums like Amused to Death in 1993 and Who Else in 1999 showcased his willingness to push boundaries. Notably, the album Who Else featured a haunting cover of The Ballad of Lucy Jordan by Marion Faithful which showcased Beck's ability to turn classic songs into his own with his own unique style. The 21st century brought renewed energy for Jeff Beck. He reconnected with his blues roots on albums like You Had a Coming in 2000 and Emotion and Commotion in 2007. The latter album, featuring vocalist Imogene Heap, garnered critical acclaim and earned him his first Grammy Award, finally, for Best Pop Instrumental Performance. Beck continued his collaborative spirit, working with artists like Josh Stone on the 2010 album Let It Bleed and Herbie Hancock on the 2010 album Recordings. These collaborations showcase his versatility and ability to seamlessly integrate his playing into very different musical contexts. The final decade of Beck's life was marked by continued artistic exploration and a focus on instrumental music. He released albums like Loud Hailer in 2016 and Cop Car in 2018, featuring a blend of rock, blues, and electronica. Notably, Loud Hailer featured a blistering cover of The Wolf Will Bite Your Ass by the group The Germs, demonstrating Beck's ability to revitalize punk energy through his playing. In 2022, Jeff Beck surprised fans with a collaboration with actor Johnny Depp. Their album, entitled 18, featured a collection of mostly cover songs showcasing their shared love of blues and rock music. And despite mixed critical acclaim, the album highlighted Beck's ability to connect with musicians across generations. Jeff continued to work almost right up to his death from a bacterial meningitis infection on January 10th, 2023 at the age of 78. As a solo artist, Jeff Beck released 17 studio albums, 11 live albums, and three compilation albums. Of those, 10 hit the top 40 in America, with only 1975's album Blow by Blow getting into the top 10, topping out at number 4. He also released 22 singles, although they really didn't chart in America. My personal favorite song of his, by the way, will forever be the song Ambitious, which is off of my favorite album of his again, 1985's Flash. I highly suggest you check that album specifically out. It's a masterpiece. Jeff Beck also won eight out of 17 Grammy Award nominations. His influence on guitar playing is undeniable. His innovative techniques, such as that finger-picking style that we talked about earlier, along with his use of feedback, continue to inspire guitarists worldwide. In his ability to seamlessly blend genres and collaborate with diverse artists across all types of music, broadened the landscape of rock music forever. The iconic guitar player Jeff Beck, born June 22nd, 1944. Last, we salute a man who I bet most people know more for being an actor than as a musician. This man is a Rhodes Scholar, a captain in the United States Army, a commercial helicopter pilot, and a country music legend. 
He's been an actor, musician, and a singer-songwriter. He wrote songs such as Me and Bobby McGee for his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Miss Janis Joplin. He was married for a time to singer Rita Coolidge. Plus, he started a country music supergroup called The Highwaymen with Waylon Jennings, Johnny Cash, and Willie Nelson. However, for a younger generation, probably Gen X, he's probably best known for playing Whistler in the Blade trilogy movies with Mr. Wesley Snipes as Blade. A huge happy birthday to a modern-day Renaissance man and winner of five Grammy Awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award. Mr. Chris Christofferson, born June 22nd, 1936. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for June 19th through the 25th. Thanks for listening. <laughs>